Revenue operations is much more than words in a job title. It's a methodology that is transforming sales, marketing, and customer success teams into high-performing revenue drivers. However, many revenue leaders still have critical questions about how to operationalize it. Furthermore, they want to know what others in the industry are doing. That's why we conducted original research and put together our findings in the 2021 Revenue Operations and Customer Acquisition Benchmark Report. In partnership with RevOps Squared, we asked hundreds of cross-departmental revenue leaders across top companies to reveal their approach to revenue planning, analytics and revenue operations, and customer acquisition. We've identified exactly how teams are aligning to hit their revenue targets, as well as the new activity, pipeline, and customer acquisition benchmarks to strive for in 2021 and beyond. Download the entire report for free at ringdna.com slash revopsreport. What if your sales team could know the moment a buyer arrives on your website and talk with them instantly? With Qualified's conversational sales and marketing platform purpose-built for Salesforce, that's all possible. It's not rocket science, it's common sense. Conversations move deals forward. Live chat, voice calls, and meeting bookers accelerate sales conversations without a single email exchange. Capture prospects in that magic moment when they're most interested in learning about your business. Head on over to qualified.com to chat with their team and learn more. So instead of making 150 calls to 150 different businesses, I'm talking about calling 20, 30, 25, maybe 50, sometimes my favorite number a day, and just going and calling that over and over and over again, three to four times each company or more a day. And people don't do that for one reason. They're terrified of burning their list. And if they did it wrong, they would burn their list. What they do is they identify themselves every time they call. Hey, this is David calling from Ring DNA and leaving a voice. And if they do that, they've identified themselves a hundred times and now they have burned themselves and there's a picture of them on the wall for the gatekeeper. Never let David in. But if you don't identify yourself, and this is all part of the process, you're the gatekeeper. Hey, Andy, how's it going? Great. Hey, could you patch me over to Bob? You don't even have to give your name out. Hi, friends, and welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. That was David Walter. David's the author of a book titled The Million Dollar Rebuttal. Cold calling is not a numbers game. In our conversation today, we dive right into the topic of cold outreach and why David believes that you can set 10 times the meetings with half the calls. So we dig into what David says is the right mindset for prospecting, why your sense of determination may actually come across as desperation to your buyers. And we also get into how to harness the power of your subconscious mind to develop the right mindset for calling. So all of this and much, much more before we get to David, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it. If you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it. David, welcome to the show. I'm excited to be here. You look well rested. You look well rested. You were just on vacation, you told me. Yeah, just back from Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Vallarta. And uh, yeah, like, did you say you had encounters with uh, very large reptiles down there? Well, we had, you know, close. Uh, Somebody got attacked just the day after where we were at. So we, you know, breezed by. You know, we had that feeling of going through the jungle just before we got this beautiful beach. And they always, anything beautiful? Is always dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Something nasty is lurking by. Yeah. yeah, well, that could be. I've I've, I've never been down there uh, to Puerto Vallarta, but uh, it is supposed to be beautiful. Oh yeah, it's you got to know the right spots. Okay, all right. So they got some white sand beaches and everything. So all right, well you can. But it's uh, good to be back here. A lot of people got sick at my party, so it's good to be back in the good old USA. Sick with COVID? Oh uh, no, Montezuma revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, first time I went to. To Mexico on business. It was an international sales meeting, actually for for Apple back ages and ages ago when I worked at Apple. And I like one of the really early international sales meetings they had, and and we were in Acapulco. And 
Yeah. Uh, I th- I th- everybody got sick. I was. I think it was. I think we attributed there was a. They'd taken us to a, uh, you know, sort of a quasi bullfight, you know, an arena, not where they were, you know, torturing the animals, but sort of, you know, a humane bullfight, and for an evening affair, and there was music, and there was food out, like uh, raw shrimp, I think is what they sort of decided the culprit was. But people were so sick that they actually flew in extra supplies of Pepto Bismol, <laughs> and so when I was up presenting to few thousand people in this large ballroom sitting at tables. Yeah, the lights were dark back there, but everybody had like this little pink thing in front of them. This bottle of, it was like a, you know, the lift light on a you know a lift vehicle. Um, <laughs> it's like thousands of Pepto-Bismol bottles arrayed in front of me. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love your, your Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... <laughs> We exhausted the supply in Acapulco, but uh, yeah, it was fun. Beautiful beaches, though. Well, good. Well, good to have you on. Um, so we were going to talk about your your book, The Million Dollar Rebuttal, Cold Calling is Not a Numbers Game. Um, yeah, well, holding it up, uh, even though this is audio only, you can still hold up the book. I, I can see it. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, in your in your mind, in your picture, in your mind. Yes, everybody's listening. Think about the cover, million dollar rebuttal. So, yeah. so tell us the premise for the book. Well, um, the the main premise of the book is the end of the book. So it's it's really like Zig Ziglar or it's uh, the Seven Habits. Think with the end in mind. Right. And so the end of the mind is the million dollar rebuttal, and I realized. This is something that happened a long time ago when I worked in a, in a call center. And I reimagined tell them to meet my goals and make a lot of money with the commission setting 15 appointments a day every day for six months. I had tapped into my subconscious mind and, and for six months reimagined cold calling and had created, without realizing it, a, a fishing weir, um, which is basically like a funnel where you block off a river. Mm-hmm. Right, 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 right. Yeah, everything goes into one funnel, and it funnels into a trap. So all traffic goes in, and that's what the Million Dollar Rebuttal is. It's a fishing weir. It's a trap at the end of a funnel, and the opening funnel takes all traffic. And so it was a way that I created a process where by agreeing with people and saying things that they would agree with right at the front of a call, it created a open, wide open spout mm-hmm. right? mm-hmm. where all these people come in. And then naturally led to a point to where I they would ask me for information. And the entire pitch was designed so that to plant the idea of them asking me for information by design. Right. And then once they did that, yeah. So once they said, give us an example. Yeah. So once they asked me for information, you know, like hey uh Andy, uh tell you what, uh could you send me information about ring DNA? Uh, what happens there is that most prospecting, most co-callers, that's an uh, endpoint. Uh, they don't want to send information. Right. And they argue They argue without realizing it because they, they feel that it's a waste of time to send information out. They feel it's a way of them saying no. And so they try to rebut that, rebut it, mm-hmm. right? And I was at that point where I was getting all my – I was getting 40 contacts a day. I was getting all the people to everybody to talk to me all the way through my presentation, and I was losing them all at that point for two weeks. I didn't close, I didn't set any appointments. Right. Right. As they say, when you're building something new, it's got to get messier before it gets better. Right. And that was the point where it got really messy because I was at the point where I was getting everybody to talk to me. And then at the end, they all disengaged, and I tried to argue with them when they asked me for information. So the million dollar rebuttal, Andy, and viewers and listeners out there, the main thing was I would just say, great. I would love to send you information about ring DNA. So it was a complete op- polar opposite. It was a complete polar opposite to what people do, which is to try to re- you know argue with right. them or to – yeah. And so what was the response you'd get then? And so what the response I got was crickets. <laughs> crickets. Because people, it was like uh, choose your own adventure, right? 
Uh, if you ever read those where you can make your choices, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was a page, it was a page of choice no one had ever gone to before because salespeople rarely ever agree to send information, <laughs> so they didn't know what to do, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful, and so I tell people in the book is you can plant ideas in their mind and by asking questions, and I would just say when there was a pause, right, I would just be like Andy, tell me what type of information you want, and this is seven habits. Mm-hmm. I didn't have read the book yet, but after reading it, I realized this is just like Seven Habits, where I'm I'm basically trying their idea or their concern about information. I'm very concerned about it, and I'm asking them like, what type of information? What would be the best? And they get the feeling that I really want to send them information, like sincerely, mm-hmm. and that's the key to dislodging any objection. And this is the powerful, and I dislodged it completely. And then I just ask them, the ser- this is where the million dollar rebuttal comes in. I just ask them a series of questions that makes them think, and it's almost like uh, never, uh, never, what is it, never split the difference? Mm-hmm. Read that book, right? Mm-hmm. Where he negotiates with hostages, and his, to- his ploy is, I'd love to pay you a million dollars, you know, but how, how could I, I don't know how to do that. Right. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. And he leaves it in the person's mind for them to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is all from how to win friends and influence people. It's that main idea of it's better. If it's your idea to book me in the show, you're more likely to do it than if it's my idea. Right. We we love our own ideas. We mm-hmm. fall in love with our own ideas. Right. right. And so basically, I just keep asking questions until you reduce that to, that argument to absurdity. You know, the, the idea that you want me to send information I put it out there when they don't know. I, you know, I'd say you want testimonials, you want some brochures, you know, and then they're like, well, yeah. And the key is, I like, do you want pricing? And boy, everybody jumps on that one. I call that red meat. I throw it out there and I just drag it along, you know, like in the cartoons, they can smell it, and they're waving, they're mm-hmm. floating on the small, mm-hmm. you know. This is desire in the world to get a price without having to see a salesperson or go through the whole painful process of meeting with salespeople is like, un, you know, they love it. And then of course I start dragging it away. Right. But, and I just, I take away and say, but I don't know if you want that. Do you really want that price? And they're like, at that point I've got them. They're hooked. And like, why wouldn't I want a price? Cause they know I'm sincere. Right. Cause I built that sincerity up front by asking them what type of information they want. Now I have them trusting me. And now they trust me. They want to know why I wouldn't, why why they wouldn't, not me, but why wouldn't they want it? And I'm like, well, you know, it's it's not going to be accurate. I mean, there's no way me sitting in ivory tower, never being seen your office, or your equipment, or what you have there, could even know exactly. I know I could give you a range. I know what our call, you know, it's between thousand and a hundred thousand. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know. Uh, but I have no idea, and so I just say it sounds to me like what you wanted is an accurate quote, and uh, so I just go on from there, and then finally people said, "Well, yeah, you know, it makes sense, Andy, right?" If I said you want an accurate quote, don't you? If you've gone through that process, and so then it's an accurate quote, and so then uh, you're I just said the idea. at that point, yeah, I just set the idea of what kind of what it would be to actually get an accurate quote, uh, but then uh, instead of saying set a meeting. I call it a pre-meeting, a introductory meeting. So it's the meeting before the meeting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's have a meeting before the meeting. You know, we're not going to have the meeting. We're not there yet. I'd say it's a cart before the horse. Hold on. We don't even know if you want to get a proposal yet. Let's just have an introductory meeting. And uh, then I just go through all the things that we talked about and, and check them off one by one and say, and then, this, then it'll be an accurate quote. And, you know, you may not even want to quote it all. You know, you may want to see our salesperson, you know. Do you, and I, at that point, I say, do you buy anything from somebody you don't trust, you don't like? And they're like, well, that's true. And I'm like, well, how do you know if you like us? If I sent you the proposal right now, it's the cheapest in the world, the lowest price possible, and you hated us, would you do business with us? And people are like, no. <laughs> so I'd say, well, wouldn't you agree that you can judge a company by their salespeople? Well, the way they look, the way they talk, if they're high pressured, if they know their product, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm like, let me de- let's get our sales rep out there briefly, introductory, and just get some questions and see if this is something you even want a proposal on. Mm-hmm. And then you can see if you even want it from us. Mm-hmm. You know, you see our sales guy the way he treats you. Do you even want it from us? 
<laughs> and it's irresistible. That process is irresistible. Once someone's come through the process, but the key is getting them to go through the whole process. Um, using that rebuttal without using the entire system doesn't work. But this is the first time I've ever given the rebuttal out on <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Special for so, Andy Paul. I'm so right. excited. I want to give the viewers something that they would tune into and have to watch, right? But it's just like the book, the ending doesn't make any sense if you don't read the whole book. But that that is, does that make sense? you have any questions on that? So I'm going to read the last chapter first. Yeah. Now I know. Yeah. Um, so one of the premises you have in the book is that, and that's your subtitle of your book, is a cold calling is not a numbers game. Uh, you know, people seem pretty obsessed with the idea that, by and large, that cold calling is a numbers game. So, in your mind, why why isn't it? Well, the, everything everything that I'm doing in the book is counterintuitive to everything that people think about cold calling, Andy and the and the, the viewers. Just it's reimagined completely. That's why I would love for people who have just dis discarded away, discarded cold calling, you know, got their phone and just threw it away. I know nobody can see this because it's yeah, audio, yeah. but I got a red phone in my hand. He's got a whole series of props he's, he's, <laughs> he's showing us, yes, or a red telephone, the hotline. <laughs> yeah, they've just thrown it away in the trash can. You know, it's a hunk of plastic junk. They throw it away, uh, but I'd love them to reconsider the idea because – it's not, that's one of the big things. Anytime it was funny, Andy, you asked me about that. Anytime I would go when I was trying to get reviews for the book in Starbucks all over the country, and I'd walk up to somebody, ask questions, and and I'd let them know, hey, I'm an author of a book, and they'd say, what's about cold calling? And they'd all get this weird, ugly, freaky face. Cold calling, <laughs> so, and then they just that's a numbers game. Uh, so that's something. It's our gut instinct, and it's not a numbers game. Well, but and, uh, but but you say in the book that I mean, this is a quote from the book. It says it becomes apparent that the more calls you place to a business, dramatically increases your chances of success. So uh, that seems to me like a little bit of a contradiction. So help me with yeah. that. Okay. So what what the numbers game is when it comes to cold calling mm -hmm. is a specific idea, and it's the idea that you call a hundred people a day or two hundred a day. Mm -hmm. And it's sequential calling. In other words, I call and I have a database from, say, Seamless AI that's sitting inside of sales, Salesforce. Right. And I see each lead, and I'm clicking each lead. It's passing me by. I see, I see ring DNA. That's a lead. I call that. I don't get an answer. Then I go to the next lead. I call that one. In other words, you sequentially go through 100 leads mm -hmm. or 200 or 150. You know, people come away, and they're like, I made 150 calls today. You know, I'm awesome. Uh, that's the sequential calling is what it, what I call the numbers game. In other words, if I could just call enough businesses today, I'll get a contact. Right. And what you just alluded to is the opposite of that idea. So instead of making 150 calls to 150 different businesses, mm -hmm. I'm talking about calling 20, 30, 25, maybe 50, sometimes my favorite number a day. And just going and calling that over and over and over again, three to four times each company or more a day. And people don't do that for one reason. They're terrified of burning their list. Right. right. And if they did it wrong, they would burn their list. Um, what they do is they, they, they identify themselves every time they call. Hey, this is David calling from Ring DNA. <laughs> you mean if they're leaving a voicemail? And or, leaving a voicemail. Right. And if they do that, they've they've identified themselves a hundred times, and now they have burned themselves. And there's a picture of them on the wall for the gatekeeper. Never let David in. <laughs> but if you don't identify yourself, and this is all part of the process, um, you're the gatekeeper. Hey, Andy, how's it going? Great. Hey, could you patch me over to Bob? You don't even have to give your name out. Uh, that's a tip from Benjamin, the most hated sales uh, guy in the UK. But he doesn't even give his name when he's <laughs> you don't get his name, but you could say, "Hey, this is David. Um, right. Patch me over to Bob, or could you try Bob's line?" Or I'm calling back for Bob. Or well, that one gets a little abused a little bit. Or you could say, uh, "I my favorite is go negative and say, hey, Andy, is Bob already gone for the day?'" I love the negative. I flip it around. Is he already gone? People think I know Bob. 
yeah, Bob's never here. You're right. He's already gone for the day. Mm-hmm. But believe it or not, people, they want to do the opposite. So if he's there, they want to tell me yes. Normally when I ask for him if he's in, they want to tell me no. right? But when I say is he gone, then they want to tell me that he's in. So it's reverse. <laughs> but, but, but generally what you're saying is you're trying to increase your odds of connecting with someone by calling multiple times within a period of time, let's say with a day, to the same person with an organization or just multiple people within that organization or both? Well, when you pass through, I mean, because I have cold call training, right? I have a video training. Uh, you can get my book and it's, it's, I'll talk about the end. You can get my book for free and then you'll get some emails where you can look, mm-hmm. watch the webinar and maybe get my video training. And then one-on-one, we'll talk about it if we have time, one-on-one training with me. But you can call, you try to get the, you try to get the extension number, right? So you can call the main line and uh, then you can call the extension number back and then you can call the main line again. But sometimes different people answer the phone when you call. And then if they have a dial by name, then you can dial for the sales line or you can call different people. So there's all kinds of different ways. Mm-hmm. You try the extension number, uh, see if you can get them a few times. Don't leave a voicemail. Call the, the receptionist back. Or if they have a dial by name, call the sales department and say, hey, I, I dialed the wrong, the wrong extension. Can you get me over to Bob? You know, that works really good. You're going around. So I have all those ways to get past gatekeepers are all in the book. But right. the the most important thing that we could possibly talk about, besides giving away the million dollar rebuttal, Which, is the other thank you. Yeah, the mother the mother of all contradictory, counterintuitive ideas is that you can set more appointments with prospects that don't know they have a need, aka prospects to say they're happy with what they have. Okay. Well, tell us about that. <laughs> and so when you call and you want to set more appointments like I did, you want to get on a hot streak of 15 appointments a day for six months, mm-hmm. or even if the hot streak is five appointments right a day. Or what I'm coaching people now to is in one or two days to set 20 or 30 appointments in just one or two days, right? Okay. Salespeople don't sit up by the phone all day long. If we can set up a campaign and then and, and actually set 15 to 20 appointments in just one day, right? And then they go sell those and then they can do another campaign. Right. But when you're calling, you're calling. Most people are trying to find a prospect with a need. That's the qualify. Those, and that's a small number of people have what we know in the industry is a top of mind need or problem that they have right. that they want they're looking to solve actively right. looking that's three percent or less right that's the generally generally used number right three percent yes and so um if you're trying to set a lot of appointments you're going to run into most people tell you they're happy with what they have like 80 percent of your calls 10 percent are going to be you know somewhere like 15 percent 10 percent are going to know 60, 70% happy with what they have, and the remainder are going to be, you know, um, I, maybe I'm looking if you find those. Mm-hmm. And so the way to set more appointments dramatically is not to make massive, you know, thousands of calls, hundreds of calls, but it's simply to identify the target, re-identify and say, okay, if I happen to find somebody that has a need, that's great. But oftentimes those people are getting lots of proposals, Right. You know, it's hard to even sell this when you find them. It's not so easy. But there's this vast market of prospects that say they're happy, but they don't say they're not interested. And, um, you know, the famous quote, the famous quote from uh, Steve Jobs, where he said that he doesn't, you don't, you don't give customers what they, or people what they want. You show them what they want. Mm -hmm. Although they don't know what they want. And that was the whole premise. Right. Talking about lack of value in doing market research. Yes. Yeah. You show them what they want. In other words, he said, you have to look off of the page to find something to sell. In other words, it doesn't exist yet. In other words, what I'd say is that people don't know what they need. And Mm -hmm. if we have briefly for breeze had a campaign, this is the book power of habit Mm -hmm. that failed when it first came out because they were targeting like any business People had a need for getting rid of voters. Mm -hmm. They uncovered after sending researchers out after a complete failed market attempt, they discovered that people in general don't know, not aware of their own odors in their house. 
And that's why the campaign failed. They had to switch it to saying prevent odors, right? You know you have odors, but prevent them. And then it became successful. But that idea that people didn't know or they got used to their odors, right? right? <laughs> There's a book out that I read. I can't remember the name of the book, but this is after Vietnam. This guy went in during Vietnam and interviewed all the Viet Cong that they had captured, right? And he found out something amazing, Andy. They had gotten used to the bombings. They woke up and expected bombings. It was normal for them, right? So people can get used to smells and odors. Then they don't smell them anymore. They can get used to bombings. And people who are kidnapped, they get used to their captors. In fact, sometimes they fall in love with their captor. That's not home syndrome, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it should be no surprise to the, the listeners that a business owner gets completely used to their broken old services, vendors, products. Almost like when you're a kid with your little... Yeah, I mean, little fear, fear of, I mean, they're comfortable with what they know and they're fearful of what's unknown, right? Yeah. Change is hard. Even if, even if the change is worthwhile, change is hard. Yeah, but if you know the little security blanket that kids have and yeah. it's all rattered and tattered and falling apart, stinky, right? And try to take that away from them, they, they love it anyway. Right. And that's, that's the product services people have are rattered, tattered, stinky, old, and people can't smell them and they're just used to it in their mind. Because, like you said, they don't like to change, right? Hmm? They don't take cell calls. They don't look at stuff. And so it's almost literally most businesses like ostriches with their head in the sand. They have, they're operating on some old operating system. They have old software. <laughs> and so they're happy with it, but because they don't know of a better way. And so that's the, the whole secret is that you can, you can set appointments with all those people. They're a great target. And you just have to get over that initial hump of them saying they're happy with what they have. And I just, just like I agree with them whenever they say that they, they will miss information, I'm like, great, that's fantastic that you're happy with it. Tell me more about it. Tell me more about that stinky blanket. Yeah. <laughs> tell me. Tell me what you like best about it. Yes. Yeah. And then they tell me. And then, you know, I just basically ask them a question. And people who say no won't do this. But I'm like, hey, Andy, if there happened to be a better way, if there was a faster way, a cheaper way to do the same thing you have now, would you keep your options open in the future? I mean, would you be open to, you know, if it fell out of the sky, it just hits you on the head, would you look at it? Oh, wow. <laughs> and so that's just the idea of keeping your options open. So that's the opening. That's right. the opening of the funnel, right? Right. Most people don't want to say that they're closed-minded. It's actually a challenge. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, Phil M. Jones on the show, his book, uh, <laughs> exactly what to say. I don't know if you've read that. But, What's uh, it yeah, called? Yeah, open question is, yeah. Yeah. Are you open minded <laughs> about, or would you be open to? And, and yeah, people don't want to admit they're not open minded. Exactly. That's something I learned a challenge, and it's in How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? Mm -hmm. a, a challenge. And literally, it's that, that bait that has like 30 hooks on it. If a fish gets anywhere close to it, they got them. You know, they're in the funnel. <laughs> and so that's that's the beauty of this is that when you do it this way, the reason why I'm trying to get this information out to people so they they can understand it, 60% of the calls that they terminate could all be appointments. In other words, a person go from the average of setting three a week Right? Some people set three appointments a week. Some people set three appointments a month. Not for long, they could, probably. But yeah, yeah they, could, they could double that number because all day long they're talking to people, say they're happy with what they have. And suddenly those people become prospects. And any whatever number you're setting can be double, triple, quadruple just by understanding that principle that that is not a bad lead. It's your greatest lead. And just, to, just the last thing here is that people are going to say, I hear them saying it right now, Andy. I can hear the listeners. Well, that's a bad lead. Just because they set the appointment, they're happy with what they have, they're not going to buy anything, right? It would be a waste of my sales, my time. And boy, you're there wrong because SATA Systems, one of my old customers, uh, when I had my own call center for 13 years, mm -hmm. made millions of dollars 
set him with my appointments because he understood this principle. Tony Safion, now it's a multi-million dollar company around the world. He understood that his best prospect was one that was happy with what they had, but open-minded. Sure. Well, yeah. Because he, they're, seeing, uh, they're seeing the value in what they have, but are, as you said, open to the idea that, well, if this works this well, what if there was something better that worked better? Yeah. Produce better outcomes, yes. And so that's the, uh, there was one attorney that told me, it was a, the office manager. I was on the phone. This is a long time ago, but I was on the phone with her. And, you know, She told me it was IT. She loved her IT guy. You know, I just want to let you know, David, that we love our IT guy around here. I'm like, okay, I get it. I understand. I'm not trying to change anything right now. You know, we're just talking about the future. And then she told me about how it worked and operated and everything, his rates. And I said, well, uh, you know, if there's something better, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, yeah, I would open, I'd be open minded to listening or finding out about it. And they're thinking information, right? That's mm-hmm. the key. They're thinking information. They're not thinking have a sales rep come out. <laughs> That's the key. I'd be ha- yeah yeah and then then you have that's asking for that's getting permission to pitch basically right mm-hmm. then you pitch them that's something new better different you explain it to them and I explained it this was 25 years ago if you know about IT Andy it's flat fee unlimited was a new idea back then okay you know paying per hour uh, waiting for it to break versus being proactive and you right. know that right. unlimited IT was unheard of most IT companies would never even think of doing it. They would say, I can never do unlimited IT. You know, <laughs> never. And so she she literally said, that sounds interesting, but I don't think it's possible. She didn't think any company would do that. And so I ended up convincing her to challenge her. I challenged her to let Tony come out and just show her. I said, I want to show you that Tony's a real company. He's a professional. He's networked. He's in lots of boards of companies and show you he really has it. And she's like, okay. But Andy, she told me she was happy with her IT guy. Yeah. Ten times. In fact, she closed the call by saying, David, remember, I know Tony's going to come out here, but make sure you communicate to Tony that we are completely happy with our current IT guy. And so I was like, I'll tell Tony. And I, two I weeks agree. Later, I, think, I think our best prospects are people are happy with what they've got. Yeah. Um, and two weeks later, because, as I said before, they're being productive with it. They oftentimes they're happy with it because they're being productive with it. Um, sometimes yeah. people say we're happy with it just – yeah, I'll try to cut short the conversation. But yeah, if you get people are talking about what they're doing, as you do, and they take pride in, in what they're accomplishing, achieving with their current, and then that opens the door. You said the you conversation is what if, what if there's a way to, yeah, if it increase your productivity, increase your the return on investment, whatever the, the metric is. Yeah, if but they're he, happy. But he said that. Yeah. That lady signed a contract two weeks later. So it's not a waste of time. And all of his leads were people happy with what they had. And he made a million dollars closing those appointments. So it's not a waste of time. It's it's what everybody should. And I mean, we're following in Steve Jobs' footsteps. If if Apple could make become the world's most successful company. Most valuable company, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with this idea that people don't know what they want and you have to come up with what they want, show them what they want. It's the same principle. Yeah. Well, I mean, this goes back to Henry Ford when you know he said if you had asked consumers back in the Model T days what they wanted, they would have wanted a faster horse, not a car. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In other words, just a tiny little bit incremental benefit because they can't imagine a much better way to do it. And that's the entrepreneur's job. Ultimately, it's up to the entrepreneur this is where your job comes in if you're listening, is to incrementally find a way to be better. That's that's the challenge, right? Find a way to enhance your product or service incrementally. Not You don't want to be the Edsel. <laughs> <laughs> not that people necessarily remember what the Edsel is. <laughs> uh, but that was the automobile that was way ahead of its time in the future. Nobody bought it, failed. He was too far ahead of the market. Yeah, it was a model of Ford. I, that- Arguably, I'm not sure it's too far in the future, but uh, yeah, it, it was touted as such. And it, yeah, it was a it was back in the early late '50s, early '60s. I think was a pretty miserable failure. Yeah, it was a great movie about it in the '80s. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's okay. That's okay. I'm, that's <laughs> it's a it's a well, worthwhile story. So uh, another point I want to talk to you about is is um, yeah, you know, you talk in the book about. And I think this is an important point, is, is you, know, you have to remain vigilant that determination does not become desperation. So tell us what oh. you mean by that. 
Yeah. So, um, and how do you keep what them happens when you're cold calling? When you're doing a numbers game, you try harder, faster to call more people. And what can happen mentally, especially if you have not set up your first appointment of the day, right? And you try to get that first. You're like, I want to get that one under my belt to so mm-hmm. get momentum. And you try to do that without realizing it, you can become desperate for an appointment. Right. And at Andy's point, I tell people in the book, the desperation is like the worst smelling odor in the world. They need Febreze it, for that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it propels people. They see you coming. They smell you. And it's the opposite of being uh, confident. And confidence is literally not caring about the result. You know, I don't care. And that was my attitude when I said 15 appointments. I didn't care, but I cared enough. You mm-hmm. know, you have to care a little bit, but not enough. I say it's a mixture of, of emotions. You have to not care, but care a little bit. Well, I mean, you have to care, but you have to understand, too, that it's it's not a judgment on you as a human being. Yeah. So that's where the not I'm, caring not comes from. Right In other words, I'm so confident that I will set appointments at some point during the day. If this guy says no, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I just go to the next call. Somebody's going to tell me yes because mm-hmm. you know, I believe in my product and I know I'm great at pitching it. And so I'm just going to dial and all I can do, I tell people in my training videos is that you can't make anybody do anything in this world. Nope. I, I can't make them say yes. All I can do is try to persuade them, you know, try to show them and tell them and educate them to understand the benefits and, but they can say no and I can't make them. And once you realize that you don't get bogged, you don't get depressed or worried. Um, when you get a, a no answer, you know, that guy just didn't understand. Or sometimes people are literally, you know, if I was doing credit cards uh, for MBNA America bank and we were calling about our rates and everything, somebody actually had a card with lower interest rates and no annual fee. And they had the travel insurance. They had, well, he doesn't need our card. You know, I'd say, well, you want another card? <laughs> but there are people out there that have great IT service. They don't need us to come out there. So mm-hmm. there's, I don't get threatened about that. Um, but if I am talking to somebody that actually has some holes in their their service, right, and they do need us, they don't know it, Right. Um, I try to educate them, but I, you can't win them all. No. No, but and you, in the book you point out a good point, which is that whether it's – uh, you know, somebody that says they're happy, or you know, send information, and you're you're doing some probing, and you're you know being enthusiastic about the prospect of sending information, as opposed to suddenly shutting down and so on. Is is you're just trying to find a way, find a way to connect with that person and establish some sort of common ground. Uh, rapport, yeah, rapport is the kind of a lost art of building rapport. And what I realized is that you know if you're face to face selling, so selling cars. You build rapport in a different way. If you're on the phone, you don't have the same rapport tools. You're not even face-to-face with them. Um, You may not spend the same amount of time with them. So you need new tools. And I just posted today on LinkedIn uh, about the Jungle Cruise. And I watched the movie coming out. Uh, Well, the the ride. I watched the ride itself. Okay. About the ride and how it came out. And it was, you know, fairly successful, but people weren't riding it multiple times. Because it was the same ride. It was boring. And Walt Disney heard that. He went to Imagineers and said, what can we do? And they decided to make it funny and to make the skippers tell jokes. But every time, different jokes. Mm-hmm. And so bad humor, suddenly everybody wanted to ride and hear the new jokes over and over and over again. So humor on the phone, and it really, it's the same as the Jungle Cruise. Canny. I mean, corny jokes. Mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> Dad jokes. Corny jokes, funny jokes, puns. Uh, you can say on the phone and relieve people uh, and suddenly make them laugh. And there's no better rapport than laughing with somebody. Uh, but, of course, complimenting them builds rapport. Asking them uh, questions to learn about them. In, being interested in them is yeah. still the most reliable way. right? People love to... Not necessarily but talk about themselves, but also like to know that others are interested in them. I mean, that's, uh, Cialdini wrote that about his book and his book, Persuasion, about, you know, people like to do business with people they think like them. And, and one of the ways you exhibit that you, you know, find someone likable is you inquire about them. And compliments, I call compliments sincere. Compliments are the oil 
that co- that oils the cogs of the wheels, right? I mean, literally, imagine an engine running without oil, and it's all rough and and it breaks down, and you have to have oil lubricate it, and the lubricate the conversation between me and you, and make it go smooth. You have to have that layered in oil called compliments that are sincere. Not a lot of them, very few. Well timed, well placed compliments. I love to compliment someone's voice. You know, you hear a guy answer the phone, he sounds you could sound like he's a broadcaster, right? He's got that deep baritone voice, you know. Mm-hmm. And I a compliment people usually know if you they have a great voice. And I compliment that voice and say, Man, were you ever in radio? You know, that was my comment. You ever in radio? And then usually people at college. I was on radio. Mm-hmm. Right? Wow, you missed your talent, you know. You know, and then suddenly, you know, what's so amazing is two people could call the same guy, could call, both call you, and have two separate different outcomes. And the difference, really, because all we're asking people, this is what I realized. All we're asking is, what, 15, 20 minutes to meet with somebody. And most companies meet with people throughout the day anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're simply asking them to have a 15, 20 minute conversation with us instead of somebody else. And it's not really that big of an ask. And when, if, if you like me and I say something half intelligently and I rouse your curiosity a bit, well, of course I'll have you coming for 15, 20 minutes. Why wouldn't I? Uh, especially if you made me feel good and important. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just being human with someone makes it makes a huge difference. So, well, good. Well, uh, David, unfortunately, we run out of time. Uh, so, tell folks how they can learn more about what you're doing. Yeah, well, um, it's uh, I have a website, and you can put it in the show notes, claimbookoffer.com, claimbookoffer.com. Okay. You can get a free copy of their shipping charges. So, if you go to buy it, and then you suddenly see $9, that's the shipping charges. So, I do have to ship it out. So, don't be surprised. It's free. The book's free. It's a free book. I paid for them. I've got like, I always keep a hundred around to send out, but uh, yeah, check that out. And I am looking for right now. I have a special promotion that you go through it where I'm looking for 50 people to become coal in my cold calling army to become trained Marines and killers that don't let a prospect off the phone until they buy or die. <laughs> and I actually get the videos and you get to work with me one-on-one. It's a really special offer. So check that out. If you want to work with me, coach me, coach you. All right. Cool. All right. Well, stay away from the uh, large reptiles and <laughs> uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again. Oh, yeah. And uh, don't forget about Ring DNA and uh, Yoda.ai and then my book. And we'll Fits make all right that in. Better. All right. Yeah. You put <laughs> okay. it all together and you kill it. Thanks, David. <laughs> okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. As always, I'm so grateful for your support of the show. And I want to thank my guest, David Walter, for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can do all that on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this episode is over. So thank you. And thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Hi, friends. I have something really exciting to share with you. We're launching a new podcast called the Rev Ops Podcast as part of the Ring DNA Podcast family. Today's leading B2B companies are embracing revenue operations as the answer to misaligned people, processes, and data that lead to recurring sales inefficiencies. However, many people still have critical questions about Rev Ops. What processes and tools do I need? How do I structure my team? How do I measure outcomes across sales, marketing, and customer success? And what are the best practices for doing that? So join Jordan Henderson, Jonathan Stevens, and Brandon Redlinger, and some of the world's leading revenue operations leaders as they tackle the important questions many of you face today when building a RevOps function. 
From Ring DNA, the company that transforms sales teams into high performing revenue drivers, comes a podcast guaranteed to go beneath the surface level conversations and dive deep into the world of RevOps. Your hosts deliver unfiltered, thought provoking discussions and actionable takeaways on every episode about the ideas, processes, and technology changing the B2B sales landscape. Visit ringdna.com slash RevOps to learn more or subscribe now on your favorite podcast player. What if your sales team could know the moment a buyer arrives on your website and talk with them instantly? With Qualified's conversational sales and marketing platform purpose-built for Salesforce, that's all possible. It's not rocket science, it's common sense. Conversations move deals forward. Live chat, voice calls, and meeting bookers accelerate sales conversations without a single email exchange. Capture prospects in that magic moment when they're most interested in learning about your business. Head on over to Qualified.com to chat with their team and learn more.